day 90 of the war in Gaza. IDF chief of staff Hertelevi told officers that the military efforts must continue until it's safe for all Israelis evacuated from border communities to safely return to their homes. Alevi said there could be at least a year of military activity in Gaza in order to accomplish the goal. Altavi Steve Leibovich has more. Day 90 of the war in Gaza and the IDF continues to push toward the largest remaining Hamas stronghold in and under Khan Yunus. In northern and central Gaza, the efforts to clear areas of terrorist infrastructure are ongoing. The IDF has now released footage of the dismantling of the infamous 250-meter Hamas terror tunnel under the Al-Shifa hospital in the Gaza Strip. The operation of destroying the tunnel was delicately handled so as not to damage humanitarian activities. Reaching and destroying the Al-Shifa tunnel network was cited as a strategic goal in the war because it served as a route to several significant terrorist centers and allowed Hamas to conduct its activities discreetly and beneath the surface. IDF Chief of Staff Alevi spoke to troops, saying that while much has been accomplished in the war, troops would be needed inside the terrorist enclave for the next year in order to restore security to residents of the south. קודם כל אנחנו מסתכלים קדימה, אנחנו הולכים לשנות את ההגנה בשגרה, אנחנו נחזיק לפחות בשנה הקרובה הרבה יותר סד"כ בגבולות ונגיע למשהו שהוא הרבה יותר חזק, כי האירוע הזה כמה שהוא קשה ונדבר עוד הרבה, היה אפשר לדעת, אי אפשר היה לדעת, הוא לא יכול לחזור על עצמו, זה בטוח ואנחנו צריכים לתת מענה מאוד מאוד חזק בעניין הזה Meanwhile, the head of the Mossad spy agency, David Barnea, warned that anyone involved in carrying out Hamas's October 7th onslaught signed his own death warrant. Speaking at the funeral of former Mossad chief Tzvi Zamir, a day after the assassination of Hamas's deputy chief Salah al aruri in Beirut, Barnea reminded mourners that all terrorists with blood on their hands are tracked down and killed. אנו נמצאים בעיצומה של מלחמה. והמוסד, היום, כמו לפני 50 שנה, מחויב לבוא חשבון עם הרוצחים שפשטו על עוטף עזה ב-7 באוקטובר, עם המתכננים ועם שולחיהם. זה ייקח זמן, כפי שלקח אחרי טבע, הטבח במינכן, אבל ידינו תשיג אותם בכל מקום בו יהיו. The Mossad chief had this message for the mothers of the terrorists. תדע כל אם ערבייה שאם בנה ישתתף במישרים או בעקיפין בטבח של השבעה באוקטובר, דמו בראשו. was created exactly for these times like this. So every Jew can fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah vowed revenge for the assassination of the Hamas deputy commander in Beirut, but did not commit war with Israel. In a televised address from his bunker, Nasrallah claimed that his efforts in the Lebanon were preventing Israel from achieving its goals in Gaza. And now TV's Devo Klein has more. Speaking from his underground bunker for fear for his life, Hezbollah terror chief Hassan Nasrallah claimed that his Lebanese forces are not afraid of a war with Israel and vowed revenge for the killing of Hamas deputy commander Saleh al aruri in Beirut. In a televised speech, Nasrallah called the assassination a crime and said there would be no ceilings and no rules if Israel launched a war. However, in his long-winded, blustery speech, Nasrallah failed to commit to expanding attacks on Israel at this point. <laughs> ووفاقه القادة والكوادة في القسام وفي حماس الذين استشهدوا بالأمس في عدوان إسرائيلي فاضح Nasrallah made some unfounded claims exaggerating Hezbollah's accomplishments and insisted that his efforts in Lebanon 
were preventing Israel from reaching its goal to destroy Hamas in Gaza. Israel has been warning Hezbollah that the cross-border attacks from Lebanon could lead to war. Jerusalem is demanding that terrorist forces withdraw north of the Latani River, as called for in the UN Resolution 1701. Chief of Staff Halevi was on the northern border visiting troops hours before Nasrallah's speech and said this to northern commanders. Just hours after Nasrallah's speech in Beirut, the IDF attacked Hezbollah positions in southern Lebanon. Four Hezbollah terrorists were killed this morning in an IDF strike. Overall, the number of dead Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon has risen to 147 since October 7th. And joining us now, former National Security Advisor, retired General Yaakov Amidrol. General Amidrol, let's start with Gaza, the 90th day of the war, 70 days since the start of the ground incursion. It appears that most of northern and central Gaza is firmly under IDF control. How long are you expecting before that same control can be extended to southern Gaza? And is control of the crossing to Egypt really a military objective? I think that it will take, uh, I don't know, a few weeks, a few days, um, but it will take a long time to clean the area. So even after gaining military control on both sides of the, uh, of the Gaza Strip, it will take a year to clean Gaza from all the um, remnants of the uh, Hamas organization. We have to go from hall to hall, from underground tunnel to underground tunnel, to headquarters to headquarters, to, um, to find all the areas, all the places in which they produce the weapon systems and to destroy all of them and to kill the, the, the leadership which is still exist in the, in the, and still alive in the, in the uh, Gaza Strip. About the, um, the crossing to, to, um, to Egypt, to the Sinai um, Peninsula, uh, this is a, a big uh, and a good, very good question. We have to find a solution to the fact that probably, we don't know, but probably there were some tunnels under the, the border between Egypt and, and the Gaza Strip, and not less important, some of the weapon system had been smuggled in through the Rafa uh, crossing. Um, that will be a long conversation between us and the Egyptians, how to find the solution yes. which will satisfy both sides. Of course, this border is still untouched now. Looking north, the other front, yeah. Hezbollah leader uh, Nasrallah made a speech shortly after the assassination of Hamas deputy head al Aruri. A lot of bluster, but not really commitment to broadening its confrontation with Israel. No war in the north from now. For now, how do you see it? I think that th this is the, the 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 biggest or the more challenging question that Israel is facing. What to do in the north when the goal is very clear to bring all the uh, people which evacuated themselves from the north back to their uh, houses and, and settlements. Um, in some places, uh, some of the houses have been destroyed by, by Hamas, by uh, Hezbollah. But this is the main question, how to push Hamas in the north to the, city, to the line in which he is not threatening anymore the settlements and the, uh, and the population of uh, north uh, Israel. There are Basically, uh, three options. One is international pressure that might help. My assessment that the chance to achieve it by international pressure is very uh, little. Um, 
The second one is a war, a big war, which will be much more devastating than the war in Gaza, um, 10 times um, more challenging to the IDF, um, more than 10 times problematic for the homeland um, from Tel Aviv uh, to, um, to Haifa. And the, uh, and the third option is to go back to the same, without a war, to the north, to uh, strengthen the, the uh, um, allocation of the uh, IDF forces into the north. In every place that was a, a battalion would be a brigade and so on and so forth. Um, to a um, stronger uh, barrier between Israel and Lebanon that will, cannot be crossed within minutes. And to enhance the ability of the people to defend themselves on the ground, that will give them more um, feeling that they control the situation and they, they have the, the way to defend themselves. I'm not sure that they, that will be uh, enough for these people to go back to the north. Um, and then Israel will have to pick and to decide if a big war against Lebanon is an option that should be taken cannot be excluded. The situation might lead us to this uh, decision. Yes, of course, we cannot forget 200,000 people displaced in the north and in the south. There has to be a solution for that, whatever we do. Thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe. You're all, you're all most welcome. And Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. The U.S. plans to keep warships in the Middle East to deter the Iranian and Houthi threats. The White House also says it's keeping a close eye on developments in the Israeli Hamas war and is working to avoid a full war developing between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. More from ILTV's Steve Leibovich. The long holiday week is over in the U.S. and officials in Washington are now refocused on the Middle East. U.S. President Biden dispatched Special Envoy Amos Hochstein to the region as Washington intensified its diplomatic engagement to lower chances of war between Israel and the Iranian proxy Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hochstein was heavily involved in the maritime agreement between Israel and Lebanon in 2022. The president received regular updates from his national security advisor, Mr. Sullivan, as well as the national security team, and as you all know, he had the chance to speak again with Prime Minister Netanyahu. A U.S.-led coalition has been operating against the Houthi attacks on Red Sea commercial shipping, and Washington said that effort is ongoing. The United States remains focused on working with a range of partners to help Israel defend itself, to surge humanitarian assistance to civilians in Gaza, and of course to defend our national security interests in the region. That most certainly includes protecting the free flow of international commerce in the Red Sea. Now, to accomplish these goals, we have established and will continue to maintain a significant force presence in the Middle East. The United States does not seek conflict with any nation or actor in the Middle East, nor do we want to see the war between Israel and Hamas widen in the region. But neither will we shrink from the task of defending ourselves, our interests, our partners, or the free flow of international commerce. Certain first class Miron Moshe Gersh, 21, from Betach Tigva, was killed in a northern Gaza Strip. Gersh served in the Yalom Combat Engineering Unit. Miron was an only child, and despite the option for less fighter roles, he chose to combat duty. His dream was to be an officer. He had a passion for sports like triathlons, running, and basketball, known for his optimism and eagerness to help others. He continued to volunteer at a local fire station even after joining the IDF. His role as a fire observer highlighted his dedication to community safety. Since a really young age, Miron said, I don't have the privilege to not be a combat soldier and protect my country. Thousands protected me, and now it's my turn. Miron, may your memory and the memory of all the soldiers be blessed.
And in a heartbreaking ending, 25-year-old Sahar Baruch's story took a cruel turn as he was killed in captivity during a heroic mission of IDF soldiers who tried to rescue him. Sahar Baruch, a 25-year-old engineering student at Ben Gurion University, found himself caught in a nightmare alongside his grandmother, Gaula Baruch, and his brother, Idan Baruch, a 20-year-old IDF soldier. The family's home became a scene of horror when terrorists targeted the kibbutz on October 7th. In a heroic yet tragic attempt to save his asthmatic brother, Sahal dashed back into his burning house to retrieve an inhaler for Idan. However, the rescue mission failed as Idan was shot upon exiting the blazing building. Both Idan and their grandmother, Geula, were murdered by the terrorists, and Sal was taken hostage. Now the IDF reveals that Sal was killed during an extraction attempt by elite IDF troops last month. A cruel twist was added when a video clip released by Hamas emerged, showing Sal alive and later depicting his lifeless body. The military, despite its effort, remains uncertain whether Sal was killed by his captors or in the crossfire during the extraction attempt. Sal, who had returned from an extended journey in South America just a month before the horrific events of October 7th, had plans to start his studies in the electronic engineering department at Ben Gurion University. The Baus family's suffering was intensified by the harrowing circumstance of the massacre. Today we have with us law student and model Jessica Elte, who is grappling with the loss of her boyfriend Ben Shimoni, a true real-life hero. Ben tragically lost his life while trying to save others during the Nova Music Festival massacre on October 7. And Jessica, I'm really honored to have you with us today. Thank you so much for coming in these, I can imagine, incredibly hard times. And thank you for, you know, sharing Ben's story around the world. I really want to ask you and start asking you, where were you this morning? How did it all start for you? When did you really realize what's happening and how come you weren't there with him? I was in our house at Ashkelon. I was waiting for him to come back from the party. And usually we're doing everything together. And by everything, I mean everything. I, have, I, I don't have a real answer why I stayed at home. I decided to keep Shabbat and to stay at home. And this never happened before that I'm staying at home to keep Shabbat and Ben is going to a party. It was weird to me at the moment. It was weird to him and it's weird until now. This is, I have no answers because we're doing everything together. I can't imagine. And what can you tell us about really the moment you understood what's happening there? You're opening your TV, he's calling you. What can you tell us about really the last call with Ben on which you finally understood what's happening there? Well, we were on the phone the whole morning, um, and he told me a bit what's going on there. He told me they hear shootings. He told me there is a big mess, but he didn't tell me everything. He was gentle with me. He knew I would get a panic attack. And we had a few phone calls that morning, and our last phone call was in 10 and 12 minutes when I heard that everything's okay, and he started the phone call with everything is okay. I took some friends, they're in my car, I'm trying to save some people, and I'm gonna come back home soon. I'm on my way back. And very quickly, that phone call got into a horror movie because I heard Ben say, he said, what is that? Is that terrorist, is that Arabs, many questions, and I stayed quiet on the phone because I couldn't understand anything from what happened there. Very quickly, I heard the girls in the car screaming, Ben, drive, save us, take us out of here. And I heard shootings, and I heard quiet. Jessica, and I understand Ben saved almost 10 people. He was already safe, right, near Be'er Sheva. Going back a few times to save those people, did he understand what a bloodbath it was right there? Because it's important for the viewers to understand, the morning hours, no one really understood what's happening. I mean, the phone calls started getting on the news, but no one really knew exactly what's happening. Did he know where he's going back to? to? Ben knew. Ben knew where he's going back to, and he, went few times back and again. 
he definitely knew, and more than that that he knew, the people that he saved said there were no cars in those times, just terrorists in that area. They thought when Ben came to save them, they thought Ben was a terrorist. He definitely knew, and he took the risk. This is Ben, you know, this is his personality, and I'll tell you more than that. I'm sure that Ben would have done that again if he would save them, if he, if he succeeded to save them on the third time, he would come back again to the fourth and to the fifth. This is Incredible. Ben. You know, and we're seeing your pictures on the screen right now running and saying that they thought he was a terrorist. It's crazy because he really <laughs> looks like an angel, you know, with the long hair and everything. And I see how hard it is for you. You're working as a model, I know, these days. Obviously, a beautiful girl, and you're doing an amazing job also commemorating him. What's still planned to do? I saw you did like a, an incredible thing with an address, right? I mean, to try and commemorate Ben. What are the future plans to, to continue doing so? Well, it was a hard decision to me to go back to my world, to the modeling, like to fake it to the camera that everything is okay when it's far from being okay. Um, but I think that what Ben would have wanted to me, for me, and I'm trying to do it step by step. There's many plans that just need the power and the strength to do this. And Ben is with me in every little thing that I'm doing, every photo shoot. I'm, I'm, I'm so sure of that because seeing you again, you were such an amazing couple. Any message you have for the viewers, for the world about Ben in general to try and make them understand what really happened here? Well, first of all, I think Ben was the beautiful Israeli man, not only outside, also from inside. And this is the Israeli people. We're looking for good. We're looking for achdut, it's called in Hebrew. We want to be united. united and together. And I think that's what Ben wanted to show us and to teach us in that morning because who is doing such a crazy thing? Only a person that his heart is that big and that I hope that we could take Ben's story and from his story to learn and to be united from all of the world, Jewish people from all of the world and stand, to stand with Israel. What we're going through is, uh, it's definitely, a horror movie. It is, and I definitely hope that we will all be worth what Ben did, this angel. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Only strength to you. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg, editor of All Israel News. Sign up for our free daily email for the latest news from Jerusalem. Go to allisrael.com. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected around most of the country tonight, with lows averaging around 7 degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow we will see more cloudy skies alongside steady top temperatures, seeing highs of about 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And temperatures should continue rising steadily over the weekend. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our LTV channel, subscribe to our LTV newsletter, and of course, do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all of the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Amit Harari. Have a good weekend, and thank you so much for watching.